This is called Just Delicate, the girl in the seven-year itch. Her name in the script, the character's name is the girl. Everyone else in the cast have names. She is simply the girl, the one we yearn for. I loved her the first time I ever saw her. I think we all did, male or female. I can't even remember the exact movie, but I know she moved me deeply. The question is why? It wasn't just her body and the way she carried herself. It was her innocence, her intense vulnerability, her honesty about herself, her kindness. Gee, that guy downstairs sure is a twitchy little fellow. Kind of cute in a squirrely sort of way. Nervous and shy, tender even. He does get that look in his eyes, of course, like most of them do. I mean, men don't seem to look at other girls that way, but gee, it happens to me all the time. Their eyes are so hungry, kind of pleading, and they love taking pictures of me. Like that one called Textures, I just drift wood and sand and me. It won an award. I felt so proud. And I like the flash bulbs too. It's like they're throwing little bolts of lightning at me. I try to toss the energy back at them. It makes them so happy. And why not? I feel good too. I really do. And tonight, I feel very safe. After all, he's a married man. I can tell he really loves his wife. He's not going to beg me to marry him or maul me or worse. Plus, it's my birthday. Or it was yesterday. I have a right to celebrate. A sweet guy you can trust to be a gentleman. Air conditioning. Champagne and potato chips. What could be better? I think it's just delicate. She was born Norman Jean Mortensen in 1926 to Gladys Pearl Baker, a negative cutter at Columbia and RKO. Gladys was married at 15 to an abusive man nine years her senior named James Edward Baker. After divorcing him, she married Ed Mortensen, who died in a motorcycle accident. Norma Jean was three, when Gladys had a nervous breakdown and was committed to an institution. The high-spirited little girl grew up from the age of five in a series of foster homes, where she was neglected, humiliated, molested, beaten, and at least once raped. She dropped out of high school at 15 to marry a 21-year-old plant worker, Jim Doherty. Norma Jean and Jim Doherty didn't talk much. As she put it, we hardly spoke to each other. We had nothing to say. About a year of this, she made her first lunge at suicide that we know of. When Jim shipped out to the Merchant Marine, she divorced him. The nubile girl with the Rita Hayworth mane of hair, fulsome body and ready for anything smile, got a job as a paint sprayer in a defense plant. As an army photographer noticed her toiling on the assembly line, he took some morale boosting pictures of her. They were an instant smash. The photographer who took the pinups introduced her to a modeling agency where they cut her hair and bleached it blonde. By 1946, she was divorced on the covers of men's magazines and attracting attention in Hollywood. Fox signed her at 125 a week 
changed her name to Marilyn Monroe, gave her acting, singing, and dancing lessons, and proceeded to give her the total star buildup. Unfortunately, by 1948, she had been dropped by two studios, Fox and Columbia, and she was going nowhere fast. Desperate for cash, she called photographer Don Tom Kelly, who had offered her 50 bucks to pose nude. She had turned him down, but now, as she explained, I was hungry. That night, Kelly covered the floor of his Hollywood cottage with a red velvet curtain and Marilyn stretched out on the smooth, soft fabric. Kelly described her as graceful as an otter, striking pose after perfect pose. Within a few months, one of Kelly's pictures was printed on a calendar called Golden Dreams and quickly found a place on seemingly every garage and repair shop wall in the country. Marilyn had feared that posing naked would hurt her career, but in fact, it increased her popularity and notoriety. She was on her way. I have one of those original posters, calendars, myself. I found it in a drunk trunk. Uh, sorry, I found it in a. I'm a little rattled here. Uh, just thinking about her. Uh, uh, it's, it, and found a place on seemingly, oh, I said that already, already. I found it in a junk store sometime in the 70s. Since then, it has been displayed prominently on the wall of every room of my own that I have ever had. My dad and I are waiting in a dentist's office. There's a magazine on a table. It's the first issue of Playboy with one of the pictures Kelly took of Marilyn emblazoned on the cover. Somehow, me and my dad and I catch each other's eye and acknowledge in that moment our admiration for this woman, of her womanliness, or, yes, her pure sex, before I, I even know, understood the word, or knew what it meant as something you do and something you are. I think, I think he's standing on my right, looking down, about to go through a door. I'm not more than six or seven. Glancing at her, he makes a sound in his throat that means something like, she's bad, but she's good. A fleeting connection with my anhedonic dad but the fact that I remember this moment, this shard of recollection, demonstrates the power of her emanation, the irresistible light and the shadow inside of it. One of the most famous, most iconic images in film history is not actually in the movie itself. We know the sight so well, the legs, the legs, the legs. Her hands struggling to keep the flying, fluttering skirt down, giving just a glimpse of underwear. That's how we visualize it in our minds. But in the film, we see her shapely gams spread open on the gate, the grate, the fleeting white wing of the dress. Then we cut to the top of her body, the plunging neckline her open mouth thrown back in delight. We see her lower body and then cut to her upper body, but we never see the girl whole. The shots used in the film were captured weeks later on the back light. The original shoot in New York City brought literally thousands of bellowing, screaming men out into the streets, stopping traffic for blocks around, making it impossible to finish the filming. But really, the scene as shot that night on location would never have made it onto a screen. It was much too blatant and unbridled, nearly pornographic in its intensity. There are still photos which capture that wild night. 
showing the errant skirt billowing completely over her head, her par panties totally exposed, her hands deep between her thighs, egging on the roaring men. Director Billy Wilder realized that this public performance would be a triumph of promotion, if nothing else. So he carried on while Marilyn carried on. But Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn's baseball hero, husband felt utterly humiliated and stomped off cursing. Later that night, he beat her with his belt. And then he left her. My friend Jack Larson described an encounter he had with Marilyn in the final months of her life. He knew her well through his friendship with Montgomery Clift. He was strolling down Camden Drive in Beverly Hills when a limo pulled over a few feet ahead of him. And the back window on the passenger side slid down and a familiar platinum blonde head leaned out and called to him in her whispery voice, waving her hand. Hi, Jack. Hi. How's Monty? Jack chuckled as he approached her, leaning in to see that she was wearing a white plush terry cloth bathrobe and seemingly nothing else. Maybe a splash of Chanel number no. five. He's fine, kiddo. Jack saw that the back seat was littered with flotsam. Fast food boxes and candy wrappers, empty pill bottles. What's going on, sweetheart? Jack said, leaning further in and speaking softly. He glanced over at Claude, her driver and masseur. He's the one who said Marilyn's body in a dark room could lead him home, that her skin emitted light. Is she okay, Claude? Jack demanded. Oh, I'm fine, Marilyn murmured. I just don't feel like going back to my place. It's so empty. I feel too alone, you know. So we just keep riding around. Well, but how long have you been wandering? Just a few days. Right, Claude? Six, baby. Well, but listen, kiddo. Why don't you come up and stay with me for a few days? I would absolutely love that. I'll cook you a swell dinner. You can't just, I know, I know, but I feel like I'm sinking. And Claude has been so sweet about it. Whatever you need, baby, you know that. Now there are tears in Monty would really hate this, Marilyn. He would never forgive me for leaving you like this. Well, then you better not tell him. I just can't seem to sleep in my own bed. That's all. Even when I... And now her words get a little slurry. I can fall asleep when we're driving around. I feel safe. Isn't that what moms do to get their babies to go to sleep? It works. And she giggled. I always love seeing you, Jack. Always. Always. I love seeing you too, kiddo. Sleep well. And the limo pulled away. Her hand fluttering goodbye as the window slid shut. I picture her at the end languishing in the soiled sheets in solitary anguish. Her naked body still aglow, so alone, so alone, spending nights on end on the phone with former lovers, Sinatra, Brando, both Kennedy brothers, and the one who carried the torch for her for the longest time, Joe DiMaggio. None of them ever stopped loving her as she sought to grasp a love that was lost at birth. One of the most adored women of all time, still worshipped around the world. And yet, 
eternally unreachable, especially to herself.